Right. Well, we are in a sermon series right now, a message series on becoming who we are. We've been going through this for a couple weeks now. We've got a couple more weeks to go. And this week we're doing community with a few. And essentially what we're looking at throughout this whole series is these different discipleship rhythms, these different uh, ways to follow and become more and more like Jesus. So this week we're doing community with a few, but we're going to do it a little differently for the next two weeks. So we're going to do this week and next week on community. This week I'm going to be looking at what does God say about community? What can we learn through the scriptures about uh, what it means to have community with a few? And then next week when Brent speaks, he's going to be looking at, in light of all of that, how do we at Southridge do community? How do we be faithful to what God has called us to do, having community with a few people? So, Uh, As I go into that, I have four things that I think God says about community that we need to know here at Southridge. But before I say anything about that, I just need you guys to know that this is not an exhaustive list, right? This is not everything that the Bible says. We don't have time for that. Uh, So understandably, if at the end of this message, I've missed something that you really wanted said and you're upset or you're a little mad, I want you to know that that's okay. And actually, more than that's okay, that we would welcome that feedback and that criticism. And you can email me. I'm going to get back to you within 30 minutes with a thoughtful response on all of that. So you just shoot me an email. My address is brent at Southridge Fellowship. (laughs) Brent, why does Craig never preach here anymore? Oh, that's why. Uh, There's a recent study done showed that 60% of people who watch TV binge watch their content. So they watch multiple episodes back to back. And of that 60%, 45% of those people claim that they have actually canceled social plans to continue binge watching. I don't know if you can relate to that. I don't know if you've ever been and just finished an episode and you just, oh, that next button, next episode is just right there and you want to click it and you look down at the time and you realize, I have to leave because I'm meeting up with my friends or I'm going to be late. And all of a sudden, you just get a ding. You take out your phone, and it's your friend canceling on you, and you're just like, yes. Nobody? Am I the only one who feels that way? Okay, yeah, no worries. Sure, that's fine. Well, 45% of people admit to canceling their social plans to binge. I personally love the, the show The Office. It's one of my favorites. There's nine seasons to it. It's actually a pretty long thing. It took nine years to film that. It's incredible. And I've watched it uh, at least five times all the way through. Um, And so I I love the characters because you just form such a connection with them. Right? And, and actually, it, it's kind of sad in a way, but, but at the end of nine seasons of watching The Office, I know some of those characters' fake lives better than I know some of my friends' real lives. And then when I finish the show and I've watched that last episode, I feel sad. And it's because like you have this connection with these characters and then all of a sudden the show's over and they're just gone. They're, they're no more. And I'm not, unless you like just start watching again right from the get-go, but then you really have a problem. Uh, but, uh, but there's nothing wrong with watching TV or, or connecting with, with characters as you watch these shows. But I do think that we need to understand What's going on when we do that? We need to understand the effect that it has on us so that we can be careful to not allow it to become unhealthy or to influence in an unhealthy way. Here's another uh, example. I don't really post on social media a lot, and that's not, that's not like a brag or anything. I just don't really like doing it. Uh, it's been like almost a year at least since I've posted last on social media, but I was at the gym one day, and usually I go with Carrie because... She's the one who makes me go to the gym. But, but this time I was going without her and I, I just on a run and I have like shin splints. So I'm kind of working through this and, and it was a good run and I was excited. I was like, oh yeah. And then I like felt this desire to take up my phone and I wanted to like take a photo or post to my story or something. And I was like, wait a minute, Craig, like why are you doing this? Like you never post. You're the guy who watches other people's stories. You don't post your own. And I was like, what's making you want to do this right now? And I realized that in that moment, I wanted to share my experience with somebody else. I, I didn't have, Carrie's usually there. I could be like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I could tell her what's going on. But in that moment, I didn't. So I wanted to share that. I wanted somebody else to know what was going on with me. I wanted to share that experience. Now, it doesn't matter how introverted or independent you are. You can be a full-on hermit. And like, I get it. I don't make friends well. My best man was my brother at my wedding. Like, I'm not great at that stuff. And I get it. If that's you too, not a problem. I totally am there with you. But no matter how introverted you are, no matter how independent you may be, you need community. You need at least just one friend. You crave it. You desire it. 
And when you don't have it, you find yourself wanting to reach out, wanting to go find connections. And in Western society, there is an abundance of connections. There is no shortage of TV shows and Fitstagram models that you can watch their, their journeys and you can go watch YouTube vloggers who will give you every detail of their life and produce daily vlogs. You can know them better than their friends know them. There is no shortage of connection yet. Today in this age, we are raising up one of the loneliest most anxious, most oppressed generations ever. 2017 study from the American Journal of Preventative Medicine notes this. There's a direct correlation, a direct correlation between people's excessive use of social media and their perceived loneliness. There's a direct correlation between people who are, who are feeling lonely and, and how much they turn to their social media to give them this like fabricated synthetic form of connection. Social media is not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. If you have existing relationships and you just use the, you know, the, the interweb to, to help you just bolster those, that's a great thing. There's nothing bad or wrong about that. But there is a direct correlation between the excessive use of social media and people's perceived loneliness. And I think one of the reasons why is because we have confused connection with community. I think we have conflated the two and we think that being connected means that we're in community. And the world is full of us knowing other people. I know the characters in the office better than I know some of my real friends, but I don't really know them. They're not really real either. It's the world we live in, it's full of us knowing other people. Because we find connections naturally. When you leave us on autopilot, when we're not thinking, we're not being intentional with that stuff, we'll go out and seek connections. It's fun and it's easy and there's no shortage of them, right? They're all over the place. So we'll go connect with anything we can. It's part of our human DNA. Uh, but what doesn't happen naturally is allowing ourselves to be known. When left on autopilot, when we're not being intentional, yeah, we'll go find connections, but we won't allow ourselves to be known. So you can have all the connections in the world. You can be that guy who knows everybody. You can have all the friends. You can be in a community group, whatever it is. You can have all those things. But if all of it is, is that they know, uh, that you know them and they don't know you, if it's just a bunch of connections and you know all these people, but there's no vulnerability, there's no them knowing you, at the end of the day, there won't be any value to it because value comes with vulnerability. In your relationships, in your community, the value, what makes it last, what makes it actually influence and impact and lead you into different directions is the vulnerability that you bring to it. And God shows us a picture in scripture of how his model of community involves us being known. In Psalm 139, verse 15 and 16, he says this, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before the, a single day had passed. Matthew 6, verse 7 and 8. It says, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. And then this is kind of the part, this is the important part here. For your father knows what you need before you even ask him. See, the thing that makes Christianity different than all the other faiths and all the other religions of the world is that God doesn't just want you to study the Bible and know him. He doesn't want to just throw on you a bunch of rules and you got to dress this way and you can't say those words. You got to give money to these people or whatever it is. He's not interested in just having you know him. He actually knows you. And what he desires at the deepest level is that you and him have a relationship, a community in which you know and connect and you are known and vulnerable. The connection that we desire, authentic community, requires both connection and vulnerability. Another way to say it is the authentic community that we need, that's programmed inside of us, that we desire, requires both knowing and being known. And I think sometimes there's that temptation, right? Even in social media or whatever it is, to supplement or just entirely replace the community that we should be having with these synthetic fake versions that we can go find. There's an endless source of them, TV, YouTube, whatever it is. 
And those things aren't bad. But if that's all it is, it's gonna leave you empty at the end of the day. And I think some of you guys, this is what you needed to hear. You got like another 15 minutes. You can just kind of check out, maybe get on your phone. But this is just, this was the message for you guys, this first point right here, because you guys are the caretakers, right? You're the givers. You're the ones who, you're in community. You got a bunch of people. You know all these people, but it's always you listening to them. It's always them being able to talk. You're the listening ear. And now maybe you don't engage in vulnerability because you think, oh, it's not that bad. Like my life's not that, I shouldn't, I shouldn't complain, right? I shouldn't, I should just be thankful for what I have. I, I don't want to be a complainer. Or maybe you think that you don't want to be a burden or you don't want to be selfish. Or maybe just outright you're scared to show the cracks or the things going on in your life because you think, oh, they're not going to like me or I don't want to take up their time. Maybe I won't be loved or accepted. Whatever the reason is for you, if that's you here today, I think that God is calling you to take that first vulnerable step in allowing yourself to be known in the communities that you are a part of. I think God is calling you to actually play, to be intentional, to actually practice being known, allowing yourself to be known and taking those steps that they can be scary. Sometimes you feel bad because you're making it about yourself, whatever it is, but actually taking those steps to allow yourself to become vulnerable in those communities that you're in. The second thing that uh, God says about community that I think that we need to know here today is that you were designed for community. Like actually on an individual, each person here designed by God with this explicit intention that you would be relational, that you would actually be in community. Uh, Genesis 2 verse 8 says, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. I think what's interesting here is he says, it's not good for man to be alone. And if we back up and look at the context, so what this is kind of the Genesis account, it's creation, we're really early in the book, chapter two, right? And so the earth and the heavens are made and God's like, yep, it's good. And then day and night and the stars and the moon and all those things. And God's like, yeah, it's good. And then water and the land and he separates the continents from the oceans and God's like, yeah, still good. And then he makes vegetation and plants, including like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. And he's like, yeah, still good. And you're like, you're sure God? He's like, yeah, no, it's all good. And then animals and livestock, like naked mole rats, still good. Okay, here we go. And then Adam, still good. Oh, wait. No, not good. What's interesting is that Eve hasn't come yet. The, the garden of, he hasn't thrown him in the Garden of Eden yet. And, and the, uh, the, the serpent, the snake, you know, the, everyone knows the story. There's been no sin yet, but still, when Adam is made and alone, God says it's not good. John Orkberg has this quote, it's a bit of a long one. It's a three slider, but I think it's worth it. He says, what is striking is that the fall, he's talking about the situation, the fall has not yet occurred. There is no sin, no disobedience, nothing to mar the relationship between God and man. The human being, Adam, is in a state of perfect intimacy with God. He is known and loved to the core of his being by his omniscient, love-filled creator. And God says, Oh, sorry. Uh, yet the word of God used to describe him is alone. And God says this aloneness is not good. Sometimes in the church circles, when people feel lonely, we will tell them not to expect too much from human relationships, right? That, that there is inside every human being a God-shaped void that no other person can fill. And this is true, but apparently, according to the writers of Genesis, God creates inside this man a kind of human-shaped void that God himself will not fill. It's incredible. See, you are designed to be in community and even, and yes, with God, but also with other people. And even if you don't have kids and even if you, you, know, you don't get married, it doesn't matter. You were put on this earth to be a part of other people's lives. David Kinneman, the uh, president of Barna Research Group, he notes that there's a pronounced trend of people leaving the church. When I was in Bible college, they, uh, they told us, they said, you know, uh, for every 20,000 churches that start, about 50,000 shut down. I was like, wow, you're really selling this career path. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and so there, and there's, this, there's this, this pronounced trend in the Western world of which the people are just leaving the church. And there's a lot of reasons for it, but I think sometimes what's happening, not all, the, not all the time, but in some of the situations, what's happening is that people's expectations of what they get at church doesn't match 
their experience. And here's what I mean by that. Church is really good at, at uh, messaging this like, come on in, right? And so we tell people, listen, like following Jesus is the best thing that's ever gonna happen to you. Like there's no more full life, there's no greater life that you could ever live than to follow Jesus, to give him everything. Come to church, like come experience what it's all about. And people are like, okay, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. I like what you're selling. And so then they come to church and they come here for, you know, 75 minutes or whatever. And they watch some guy wave his hands for 30 minutes. They sing some songs, drink some coffee out in the foyer, hope no one comes and talks to them. And then they go back to their life and nothing changes. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday comes and Sunday morning they come back, do the same thing over again. Then after six months or a year, they give it up. Why? Because it's not changing them. Because their expectations, what we, what we told them what happened isn't matching their experiences. I think a lot of people who give up on the church really haven't experienced what following Jesus is actually all about. See, if you just show up on Sunday for 75 minutes and that's it, that's all you got, that's, that's what your faith journey is like, man, you're not following Jesus. I don't know, you're part of a club or something. And that's what this whole actual series is about, is this idea that, yeah, celebrating big on Sunday morning, that's a great thing. We should be doing that, absolutely. But we also need to be following Jesus daily on our Monday to Saturday. We need to be having community with a few. We need to be serving one another. We need to engage the mission. And so when people decide, yeah, they want to follow Jesus, but then they just come on Sunday morning, man, that's like going to a horse show and just being sold a pony, no wonder they want a refund. My conversation with Brent as we were planning these messages because we're you know, uh, going to be speaking on the same things, he mentioned something to me that I thought was really interesting. And he said, you know, in our experience here at, uh, at Southridge, we find that if people don't connect in a community of some sort, they usually don't last longer than a year. You know, if they're coming to church, but they don't get plugged in, they don't find a good fit for themselves, they usually won't last longer than a year. And here's the thing, I really want you to last longer than a year. If you're not in a community right now, I want you to thrive. I, I genuinely do believe that the best way to experience a full life is with Jesus, that the best way to experience what God has for you is to follow Jesus every single day of your life, to be in the community, to be in the church, all those things. And I know that I speak for everyone else at this church when I say that we are for you, we want what's best for you. But now I'm gonna speak for myself because I won't get them in trouble. If you are here today, you follow Jesus, you've been coming to Southridge for some time and you're not in a community of some sort, man, you need to get off your butt and do something about it. We built a wall out there. I don't know if you saw it on the way in. We got like this light up map and we got all these magnets on it and it shows like where all the different community groups are so you can see them in your area. We got clipboards. There's got all the different open groups in there and then we have like a tablet. There's a button you click. You can fill that out and we'll do all the work for you. You just tell us like what days are available. We'll go find you a group. We will do everything it takes to remove every single obstacle in your way so that you can be a part of community. I will make Nate do whatever you want to get you into a community but at the end of the day, the single greatest obstacle to you experiencing that is yourself. And I can't tie you up and drag you to a group because that's illegal. <laughs> I asked. There's a, a lie in the Christian culture and it goes kind of a little something like this. It, it's uh, God will never give you more than you can handle. Right? God, will never, God will never put more in your plate than you can handle. So if, you, if you're going through something right now, you just need to be strong. You need to trust in the Lord and pray and submit to him. And it's, it's going to work out and you'll see it's all going to be for your good later on. It's just a lie. The closest thing I could find to anything remotely resembling that in scripture was this idea that God will never allow you to experience a temptation that you will not be able to withstand. But this idea that you're never going to have more on your plate than you can handle is not true. You need friends, you need family, you need counselors, pets, whatever it is. There are times in your life when you are going to experience challenges and things that are gonna be overwhelming for just you on your own and you need other people. That brings me to my third thing here, the third point. 
So not only were you designed for community, that's the second point. So you, on an emotional, psychological level, God actually built it in you that you were designed to be in community with people. But then also, we were designed to be in community with each other. And that's the third point. We are designed to actually be in community on a practical, on a pragmatic, on a functional, physical level. We need each other. And I think you can find this example of community all over scripture. Here's one particular example of it. Acts 2, 44 and 45 it says, all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anybody who had need. Why were they supporting each other? Because there was need. Because there were people, there were things that happened to people and they had too much on their plate. They couldn't handle it all. And so then people came in community and supported one another as there was need. So we need other people, we need our community to step in from time to time and help us when there's too much going on. Whether it's holding us accountable or actually financially providing for us or whatever it is, just supporting, loving and encouraging us, we need our community to step in. I think something the Apostle Paul understood well was that we influence people not just with our words but also with our presence. Romans 1 11 to 12, he says this, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Paul understood that we need each other, not just for like the the practical stuff, supporting each other, but also just because our presence helps and encourages each other and we encourage one another in each other's faith. There was a this past summer, there was a lady who uh, doesn't go to Southridge, but she's got family who comes here. And so she just happened to come a couple uh, weeks before we had our uh, training uh, day for soccer, for soccer camp. And so she had come up to me at the soccer camp training night. And she was like, oh, listen, she's like, I was here a couple weeks ago when you were speaking. And I just loved your message. I just thought it was so great. And I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and then I was like, well, what, uh, which, which one was that? What, what was it about? And she, she went oh, to be honest, I actually don't remember what you spoke on. And she goes, I just love this story that you told about your wife and you. And I was like, inside, I was like, you don't know what I spoke on? And I was like, I'm climbing up on my high horse, right? And just as I'm about to like saddle over, I was like, wait a minute, I actually don't remember any of my messages. I don't remember what I've ever spoken on. It could be like Sunday afternoon. Someone would be like, hey, what do you speak on today? I don't know. It's, it should be online by now. Go watch it. Like I've already purged it from my brain. I'm sleeping. I had a prof in college who told me, that people won't remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. Which is ironic, because I remembered what he said. (laughs) So maybe we should reword it. Um, People usually won't remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. So one of the reasons we were designed for community is because we need each other. We need the presence of each other to encourage us in our own faith. See, just knowing what's right or wrong or what's good or bad, that doesn't automatically mean that we do what we ought to do for ourselves. You can ask any parent in the room, just their child knowing what they should or shouldn't do does not guarantee that they're going to behave. And actually, it kind of just gets worse as you get older, because once they're a teenager, you're probably just better off not telling them what not to do, because they're just going to do the opposite to spite you at that point. Every teenager in this room, when you hit your 20s, you'll You'll go back to your parents and you'll apologize. You don't believe me now, but you will. See, just knowing what's right or what's wrong or what's good or what's bad, that doesn't automatically mean you're just going to go do it for yourself. As a matter of fact, very often we don't go do it just because we know, and especially not after someone tells us. But when you're in a community, when you're in a group of people who know and love you, who support and encourage you, who hold you accountable, who have sacrificed for you. And when you see their example and your example in turn encourages them and they're encouraging you, you are more likely to do what you ought to do for yourself, what is good for yourself. So when we're in authentic community, when we're supporting and loving and encouraging, giving as there's need, sacrificing for other people, other people who don't follow Jesus are gonna notice that. When you, when something goes wrong in your life, when, when there are challenges, when you're in over your head and your community steps up and comes and answers those calls, 
and they come and support you through those hard times, your friends, your coworkers, your family who don't follow Jesus, they're going to see that. They're going to see your community step up and show up, and they're going to be drawn to that. They're going to they're desire something there. They're going to see it, and they're going to be intrigued. And, uh, and here's, here's why. As Christians, we believe Jesus is going to come back one day, right? Uh, and so we call it all sorts of different things, like new creation or heaven or whatever, but Jesus will return one day and there's going to be a new world in which there will be no more pain, there'll be no more cheating, no more deceit, no more lies, no more hurt. We will be in full, perfect, complete community with one another here on this earth. And whether your friends know it or not, there's a peace inside of them that God has built inside of their actual soul that longs and desires to experience the community that they were designed for. And so when you live out that way, when you go live out that community and when your friends come up and support and love and encourage you, your friends, they see that and they're drawn to it. They desire it. Think of it this way. Uh, Think of a kid who was raised with super strict parents, no sugar, right? Closest he's ever gotten to is Splenda. And he comes over for a play date with your son and you just give him like a little sugar cube, just one of those pure cane sugar thing. And you just go, here, look, I suck on this for a second. He... And you, you know the moment it hits his glance because his eyes just open up and he's like, what is this? And he's just like, he's never seen anything like this before. And you know his mom is gonna be furious at you, but it's worth it because you're just blowing his little brain right now. That's probably not a great example. Don't do that. But that's kind of, we give people a taste, right? We give people a taste when we're in that community, when we're doing that, when we're loving people the way God loves us. We give them just a glimpse of what's to come. We give them a taste of how good it's gonna be. John 13, 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is God's plan. This is God's plan of spreading the message of Jesus to the world. Everyone will know if you what? If you love one another as I have loved you. See, we give a glimpse of the coming kingdom when we live this way in community. We give people just a taste of what's to come and they desire it. So one guy on a stage for 30 minutes, once a week, waving his arms around, yelling at you. That's not the plan. We are the plan. Our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that's the plan. It's not just about Sunday morning for 75 minutes. This is part of it for sure, but it's not the plan. It's not the whole thing. The way we go out and love other people, the way we live our lives in community, and when we give people a taste of what's to come, that's how we spread the message of Jesus, the life-giving, hope-giving, freedom-giving message of Jesus to the world. If you're in a community of any type, you're the plan. Invite someone. Invite someone into that. Invite somebody to experience a taste of what's to come. I'm going to give a quick recap here. So if you've been taking notes and you miss something, or if you've been sleeping, but you don't want your wife to know, this is your chance. Grab your pen. We're going to go from top to bottom again really quick. So some of us here, and this is me, myself, some of us here, we need to be intentional about being vulnerable, right? Right? Three days ago, I'm sitting down with my community group, and like, I know this, I've been in school forever for this stuff. And I'm sitting there watching how vulnerable and intentional they are, and I'm going, guys, you know what? Like, I've been on autopilot for a long time here. I haven't been vulnerable. I've just kind of been living my life. I've been way too busy. You know, whatever excuse I'm going to make up for myself, but I have not been intentional about being vulnerable. That's mine. And we need that because community requires both connection and vulnerability. And some of us here today, we need to take that first step in joining a community because you were made for it. You were made for it. Not only were you made for it, but we actually all together were made for it. There's a lot of practical, really good reasons, psychological, emotional, and spiritual reasons. We were made to be in community with each other. And so some of us here today, we need to take that first step and actually join an intentional community. And finally, some of us here today need to start praying about inviting someone into community. We're the plan. If you're in a group right now, you're the plan. 
Start praying about who God is laying on your heart to invite into community because when we do that, when we love people, when we live our life in such a way that people get a glimpse of what's to come, man, that's how we share the love of Jesus and and in our relationships and in the way we do community. That is how we give them a glimpse of the coming kingdom. Let me pray for you guys here as we close up. God, I pray that you would give us guidance and wisdom to know which one or maybe all three or maybe two or whatever it is, which one of these we need to take our first step in here today or our next step. God, I pray that we'd be able to hold each other accountable, have the boldness to actually take that step, to encourage our spouse to take that step, to encourage the people around us to take that step. I pray that we would see the way we live our Monday to Friday, our weekends, every single piece of our lives as part of your plan to share your message to the world pray that we'd be encouraged and inspired to do that, to take that seriously. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.